Hello, everybody. My name is Timothy Gager, and this is the Virtual Thursdays Dyer Literary Series, the uh, non-band version. So, uh, <laughs> complain all you want to the community standards. I am a clean member of society. So today our guest is, uh, our feature is John Wessick. And if you don't know John, uh, John has appeared at every single Zoom open mic since 2020. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of, of John history. Um, John Wessick, well, let me get to his, uh, let me get to his uh, website. They allow me to do both. It will not. So here is John. Uh, John Wessick is the regional editor of the San Diego Poetry Annual. He's published hundreds of poems and stories in journals such as the Atlanta Review, Berkeley Fiction Review, New Verse News, Patterson Literary Review, Pearl, Perrine's Fountain, Slipstream, Space and Time, The Tales of the Talisman. The editors of Not Magazine nominated his story as The Visitor and a story for the rest of us for Pushcart Prizes. His poem, Meditation and Instruction, won the Editor's Choice Award in the 2016 Spirit Fiction Contest. Another poem, Bread and Circuses, won second place in the 2007 African American Writers and Artists Contest. Richard Feynman's Commute shared third place in the 2017 Risling Award short poem category. John is the author of po John is the author of many, many, many books, and we'll get to all of those later. So just hang on to your hat there. Um, John was a regular here nearly every Friday when we started up. So it's a pleasure to have him back here on a Thursday and featuring for us. And John, thank you for stepping in. Oh, thank you, Tim. So I guess I'll read something for about 10 minutes and then you'll uh, ask me some questions if I remember the format. Okay, so uh, here's, a, here's a story that just appeared today uh, on the Danse Macabre. It's uh, called, uh, it's a website, Danse Macabre. It's called Cafe Town and I posted a link in the chat. If you like it, you can read the rest of it. I was staring at my unpaid bills over a cup of rot-gut mead when a rock crashed through my window. It was gray, probably limestone, but definitely not basalt or granite, and had a spiral fossil of a trilobite on the back. I looked outside to see who the culprit could be, but saw only a motley group of pterodactyls and stegosaurus carrying picket signs to protest my former career as a creator deity. A big guy burst through the door. He carried a snub-nosed lightning bolt, had a complexion of burnished bronze, and wore the kind of toga you could only get at one of those boutique shops on Mount Olympus. He'd brought gloom and the smell of ozone into my office with him, as if he lugged a personal thundercloud with him. I didn't like the intruder, but shooting him was out of the question. My jade scarab and my last amphora of mead were in the line of fire. You Tiamat, he said. Who's asking? Even though my bank account hadn't seen a spare drachma since that asteroid had ruined the dinosaur's day, I hated getting pushed around and despised authority figures or anyone who lords it over others. I'm a stone-cold son of a bitch who can love nothing and no one but justice. You can call me Allfather, Lord of Thunder, Bearer of the Aegis, and Keeper of Oaths. Well, Mr. Allfather, I don't like people pointing lightning bolts at me, so either put your piece away or scram. His expression could have soured all the milk from Endymion's flock. He stowed the lightning bolt in his shoulder holster. I thought you were a dame, he said. This was shaping up to be a bad day. First he threatened me with a gun, and now he was subjecting me to transphobia. Gender is a social construct, I replied, but you aren't here to discuss my genitals, real or imagined. Spill it. Someone's trying to kill me. The all-father collapsed into a chair, all the false bravado drained from his face, leaving only the look of a boy scared of the basilisk hiding under the bed. What makes you say that? My sisters and brothers disappeared one by one. When I asked my father Cronus for help, he just belched. Was he telling the truth? It didn't much matter. I had all I needed to solve the case, a hat, a gun, and a bad attitude. 
he had the look of someone important. And if I played my cards right, I could make a killing. My rates are 200 drachmas a day, I said, plus expenses. I rang the doorbell and waited. In advance of my visit to Cronus's mansion, I'd put on my best toga and polished my sandals, but I had no confidence my wardrobe would pass muster up in the hills. May I help you? The butler who answered had a long nose that seemed to match the condescension in his voice. Name's Tiamat, I handed him my card. I'm a private investigator here to see Mr. Cronus. This way, sir. The butler led me inside. Somehow the word must have gotten round, which was suspicious, because rich people usually sick a chimer on me whenever I get within a league of their homes. Excuse me, sir, the butler said to Cronus. Mr. Tiamat is here to see you. He's a private investigator. When you're as powerful as Cronus, I guess you can get away dressing like Diogenes. His stomach dwarfed the rest of his body, even though he was twice the size of a mortal. Ah, Tiamat, I've been expecting you. I'm sorry I can't offer you lunch because our larder is empty. All I've had to eat today is a few lady fingers. I doubted that. If a guy with a study bigger than Agamemnon's palace couldn't rustle up some olives and a slice of pita, my name was Epimetheus. So you know why I'm here? I took a seat. About the murderers, you mean. Cronus's eyes were the color of the wine-dark sea, but were they the eyes of a killer? Anything you can tell me would help, I said. A dreadful business. Cronus poured me a cup of mead along with one for himself. I wish it acted sooner. Poseidon has always been a jealous type, but I never suspected he'd kill his brothers and sisters. When Zeus came to me with his suspicions, I kept quiet. If he learned the truth, he'd take his wrath out on his brother. Even though Poseidon is a killer, I couldn't stand to lose another child. Cronus took my hands. Whatever Zeus is paying, you all double it. Help me find Poseidon so I can put him somewhere he can get the help he needs. Where do I start? Poseidon used to date a Nereid named Dolores. Cronus stood and walked to the bookshelf. She lives on Alameda Street. Jeffrey will give you her address. The doorbell sounded and I waited for an answer. Dolores's cabana was at the end of the cul-de-sac, surrounded by bronze merchants and falafel stands. A welcome mat with an image of Rhea lay on the step, and the air smelled of burning metal. Nobody answered, and I turned to leave. Was she at work, or maybe on the lamb with Poseidon? On the walk back to my chariot, I approached two guys in wide lapel togas. The first had big shoulders and a boxer's nose. The second was wiry and had a scar running from his earlobe to the corner of his mouth. I nodded. Before I could react, the gorilla had my arms cinched behind my back. The scarred man flicked open a butterfly gladius and waved the blade in front of my face. You're a little too nosy for your own good, pal. He was so close I could smell the yogurt and garlic on his breath. Know what happens to nosy guys? He stuck the blade in my nostril and sliced it open. They lose their nose. Next time I'll cut the whole thing off. I suppose we can stop there. Right. Well. And like, like I said, there's a link to the story in the chat and you can read the rest of it. Yeah, I will put the I'll put that link on the YouTube video that I'll upload later and I'll also put it in the Facebook group. So that way if you're not on the Zoom, you'll be able to read the rest of it. And uh, and if not, it's called Cafe's Home. Cafe Town. Cafe Town. All right. And that's on uh and that I'll is on Jack Picard. So uh you can look it up yourself. Now, John, uh, how have you been? Well, I've been okay. I've been okay, Tim. I see that you're still going strong on thursday evenings yeah um it's amazing i looked at your uh, credits and your books and the number of books that you've done have been published since the 2020 pandemic started and how many total books are you up to now oh i think it's something like 14 you know there's three uh poetry volumes two short story collections and a bunch of novels and you have basically um, published four of them since 2020 or five? 
Uh, let's see. I'd say that uh, yeah, probably four since 2020. The two uh, the two spy novels, the the John Clooney novels, and then the the two poetry collections. Uh, yeah, since 2020, I think. So you've written spy novels. You've written poetry. You've written flash fiction. Um, where do you get your idea? I don't know, but uh, you, if uh, I get a goofy idea, I want to make it real somehow, and it either comes out as a uh, poem or a story, or occasionally a novel. You know, poem is more of a like a one thought, and story kind of extends more through time. There's a bit of a sort of narrative arc to it. Well, your stories and poems have been described as clever. Never heard of them described as goofy, so I guess you take the goofy idea and you make it clever. Do you ever write <laughs> serious? Do you have other works that are just serious, real life types of stories and backstories? I'm thinking more like the Raymond Carver type. Yeah, sh well, sure, sure, I do. I, you know, I think some of the novels are are pretty serious, and then you know, some of them are be science fiction novels that have a uh, an interesting premise. Um, but, you know, the spy novels were serious, um, some of the short stories are serious. A lot, a lot of what I've been doing lately is parodies, but, you know, that's just lately. Now, so doing all those different, so lately you've done parodies. Um, tell, tell us the, uh, the, the, tell us the transformation in terms of what you want, what you like to write and what you were writing from, I would say, the beginning of your writing career to now. Like, uh, so you started as a poet, for example? Yeah, I started, I started writing poetry, then I had an idea for a short story. Uh, then I had the silly idea that, you know, if you want to really make it big, you could write a novel. And then, you, then you'd like make lots of money writing. Uh, and I wrote a novel that was kind of episodic. So it was like a bunch of short stories put together with the same characters. Um, lately, you know, I've been kind of upset with people saying that this is the way fiction has to be written you know a lot of bad uh formulaic writing uh advice and i've just been trying to write stories that just go against that and just going any kind of weird thing at all peripheral characters are the narrators maybe the uh, narrator is not human at all and not even personified um Maybe and then a lot of parodies came out of that too because that's a one way one way of uh, not uh, writing a formula. Uh, the one thing about sort of noir stories is if you read uh, Raymond Chandler, the plot almost doesn't matter. What's good about his writing are the descriptions and sort of the humor and, and wit in each of the little descriptions and all sorts of crazy things happen in the plot. You don't really know what it's like. So writing a parody like that is kind of fun because they don't have to sit down and worry about what's going to make sense. And, uh, you know, if I were writing something serious, for example, and it's in a city, I'd actually look at a map of the city and make sure that, you know, you go to this street, you got to turn on that street and stuff like that and make sure that, you know, I don't, I'm not making stuff up, but, you know, if you're writing it, parody it doesn't matter you can walk by L you drive by LAX and and then the Hollywood sign and it, you know in two minutes and it's just fun because it's everybody's uh, everybody's just making fun of stuff so that's what I've been doing lately I've done parodies a lot of, a lot of parodies of noir stuff uh, did a Star Trek parody uh, there's sort of a sort of a Western vampire parody anything and kind of everything so when you describe Raymond Chandler's work, it almost sounded like magical realism. Is there a crossover with a uh, like spy or thriller, and uh, do other writers do that? Hmm. Um, well, you can kind of turn anything into magical realism. I think I wouldn't say Chandler is is magical realism. You know, when I think magical realism, I think somebody like Kelly Link, for example, who's uh, who's very good. So, you know, uh, Jonathan Carroll may be another very good magical realism person. Uh, that's sort of more in the realm of fantasy, I would say, but you know. I mean, genres are a box, you know, you write what you write and, uh, you know, somebody else is, decides what they want to call it. Well, you you brushed upon the fact of there is now this basically how to write and you have to write it a certain way. So what is, in terms of 
cliche or advice? What's your biggest, which, which one is the biggest pet peeve of yours? Um, well, I think everything boiling down to conflict, conflict and tropes, you know, there's, there's got to be a conflict. And I think that, uh, or, you know, the advice to just say no, you know, piling up complication on complication on complication. I think that there's so much conflict in real life these days that finding more of it in fiction uh, isn't any relief. And so I think people need maybe a good laugh or, you know, some some joy in their lives instead of just constant, you know, being beaten over the head with, with conflict and, you know. I mean, not many writers switch genres the way you do. Um, so when you were growing up, who did you admire that wrote in that way? Did well, who did I admire? Not? Well, you know, I wrote a, I read a lot of, read all the James Bond books. I liked Robert Heinlein quite a lot, the science fiction author. Oh, it's kind of surprising. He was a really conservative guy, but somehow I just loved it. Just loved his books. Um, remember reading Doc Savage when I was a kid. My dad liked Doc Savage. I remember those. Those were those were kind of good. Uh, just anything and everything. My dad just read a lot of paperbacks, and I read a lot of paperbacks too. A lot of science fiction, and it depends on how old I was, you know. Uh, Dune, maybe more when I was a teenager, kind of in college, what I ended up doing was just reading science fiction, all the Hugo and Nebula Award books and following all of those. Now, did any of those influence your writings or do you separate the reading that you did back then with what you were writing? I'm sure it all, it, I'm sure it all influenced me. I think that, you know, we're living in a sea of language and it all influences you as a writer. You know, was, there all... one, was there one in particular that like, like you said, well, when I grew up, I want to write like. <laughs> um, I have Not one that novel, boy. I have one novel that boy. seems like a Philip K. Dick novel to me. Um, the the disillusionment of Hal LK2154 is kind of a science fiction novel about clones. And everybody's a clone, uh, so there's nobody that has a unique genome, and everybody's alike. And supposedly, there's not going to be any violence because everybody's the same. But it didn't turn out turn out that way. That's very much like Philip K. Dick. I read a lot of Bukowski when I first started writing poetry, and uh, I don't think I write like Bukowski. But you know, I'd stay up like 4 a.m. just reading book after book of his, and, you know, drinking green tea and writing poems. Well, Bukowski almost gave writers permission to write. Do you agree with that statement? Um, he could do it. Yeah, I can see. I can kind of see where you say where you say that. Kind of a DIY kind of uh, yeah. kind of writing thing. Yeah, I could, I could see that maybe. Now, do you miss the small pocketbook paperbacks? Because it seems like your genre is perfect for that. And I'm talking about like the you know eight inch by four and a half inches. You know the really small ones, small fonts. You know, these yeah, and you could you could buy you could buy a book for five bucks, and you know, instead of like twenty or thirty these days, yeah, I do I do kind of miss those. Well, yeah, I mean, what's to stop what's to stop a publisher from going back to there? I would love to see those again. I don't know, does, does Penguin print those still? Maybe Penguin still does. I don't know. Yeah, and and also the the painted pages on the side. Like red or yellow. Oh yeah, yeah. They have the little red or yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I remember them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so with all of the books that you've put, I put out 14 books and a lot of them fairly recently in the past five to ten years. How many hours a day do you write? Um, it comes and goes, you know. Sometimes when I'm working on something, I may spend three or four hours a day on it, and other times, you know, I go not maybe a half an hour or something. I didn't really time it. Do you, I think try, a, you try to write every day? No, I, I, I don't. I write when I have an idea, you know, but I don't stay away from it so long that I don't come back to it. Now, if you were, if you get an idea, like in you're in, say you're in a short story mode, you've been writing a lot of short stories. Is the idea of going to become a short story or does it sort of not matter when you get stricken? It doesn't matter. You know, it comes out again like 
like it's going to come out. If it's one thought, it's a poem. If it's a situation, it's a story. And I have an idea for a setup of a story, right? And so that would be, okay, here's an interesting situation we're going to put people in, but actually coming up with the narrative arc of the story is kind of different. Now, some people can, you know, outline a story, but I can't do that. I have to sort of walk through it, you know, step by step and sort of see what see what happens. I try to focus on what the pe what the characters want, you know, and then maybe take the most interesting, you know, brainstorm and then take the most interesting path from there. I prompted people to put questions in the chat for you, but I wasn't expecting this question. John, when are you going to send me another poem to turn into word art from Robert Fleming? Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'll send you one something to Robert. Sure. Yeah, okay. I'll send you something. Um, also, when the pandemic hit, you couldn't go to a Zoom reading without running into you. And uh, um, how many Zoom appearances or Zoom events do you estimate that you've been to in the the past three years? Um, well, when I started keeping track of them in a spreadsheet, I'm up to about 650. I think there was probably a year before I had the spreadsheet, so we may be approaching a thousand. Did that push you to write more knowing that, you know, hey, I've got four Zooms today, I better read something new? Um, no, I, I think I just write independent of that, but what I do is keep track in a spreadsheet of what I've read at each place so that I don't keep reading the same thing to people and people don't get bored with it. That makes sense. Uh, what about, um, which was your favorite um, virtual reading, virtual reading series? Oh, okay. Well, certainly the Di Dire Lit is very, very good. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Lit Bomb and also uh, Cobalt. Uh, and what makes a good online reading series? The, the people who read, the talent of <laughs> the people who read. Uh, there's also, um, I got um, kind of cynical. Uh, I was like, you know, the 30th person in line to read and people were just talking and making comments and making introductions longer than their poems and just going on and stuff like that. So I bought a stopwatch and I, 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 I kept track of, you know, how much time uh, was done reading poems and reading and how much time was just filler. So, you know, the most efficient readings were maybe about 70% poetry and the least efficient were maybe about 30% poetry and other than that filler. Um, I don't think you never get to 100% because, you know, there, this is a social interaction and, you know, there is some value in just people uh, being friends to each other. But I, I, you know, I even have, you know, histograms of that kind of stuff, if you like. And I also have histograms of, uh, of readings that, uh, what, how much of the poems that I like in a reading, you know, I would go and keep track and saying, oh, here's a plus one for every poem that I liked, a zero, which is kind of, you know, minus one for those that I didn't like at all, and just sort of added up, uh, added up scores, different readings, and made histograms of all of those kind of things to, uh, I don't know, I, I don't, you know, I take the names of the readings off before I share those with anybody, because I don't want to insult anyone. Well, you bring up an interesting point about introducing poems and promoting promoting yourself before you read the poems. And writers tend to be, um, and I hate to be general, a lot of writers I know will write in quiet or write by themselves. So is it hard to overcome the disconnect from like the, the writing person to the promotion person? Yeah, I suppose it is a little bit. I think I have a kind of a public, sort of a public face for for dealing with uh, with people on Zoom or dealing with editors and stuff through emails. Uh, um, you know, when I read, I just think that the poem or the story should speak for itself. So I don't really try to give too much introduction or uh, explanation of it. it you know, if it if I if it needs a lot of explanation, then maybe I haven't done my job as a writer. And so here it is, boom, there it is. Kind of take it or leave it. 
Was it difficult to go back to live readings? I know that I saw you live up in Lynn, maybe a year, year and a half. Yeah, ago. and I'll I'll be there in I'll be there on the fifth of July as well. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you know, I still know people who are getting coming down with COVID, and uh, I had it about a year ago. So I'm not sure it's completely over yet. Uh, you know, so I've. I have not been going to too many live things. Of course, I'm up in Manchester too. There aren't. Uh, there's. There are a few live events I know that that are in Concord, but uh, I haven't been to them yet. Yeah. Well, you're up in New Hampshire now, and you lived in Massachusetts for a while, and out in San Diego. Yeah. Describe uh, the literary, for lack of a better word, the literary scenes in all three of those places. Oh, I knew San Diego best because, you know, I was there for 20 years or something. I kind of knew everybody uh, in the poetry community. I thought they were very, very welcoming. You know, I uh, sort of showed up with some new poems in my pocket. Uh, Chris Van Oy, who's kind of the old man of San Diego poetry, you know, just buckled me and, you know, treated me like a, like a colleague. Uh, and so you know, I still keep uh, in touch with them at least through the through the poetry annual. Um, Massachusetts, you know, some of the readings were kind of funny because you know typically, you know, San Diego, yeah, or, or Southern California, sure, you know, you, you got five minutes, you can read th three poems. A lot of the places I went to in Massachusetts, you know. There'd either be no open reading, or you could only read one poem. You know, Dyer was very different than that when you're down at the Middle East. You know that you'd give everybody like ten minutes to read stuff, and that was a real breath of fresh air for me because I had a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to read, and you know, no place, no place to read it. Um, um, Stone Soup's pretty good, you know. Um, Speak Up's pretty good, uh, you know. Uh, Lee Eric Friedman, the First Friday Reach Arts is pretty good. Uh, Jeff Taylor's uh, Garage Poets, pretty good. Yeah. It seems interesting, though, in Massachusetts, you get a lot of, like, the the, uh, the different events and the different event genres yeah. are all very specific. For example, like, uh, if you go to the, the Cantab for the Poetry Slam, yeah. if you yeah. don't read a slam-style poem, it might not go over, or it might appear different. And... Uh, like every, seems like every uh, series in Massachusetts mm. is very, very uh, specified mm. with, yeah. except Speak Up. I think Speak Up does a great job with everybody. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I haven't been to the Cantab. I don't really know. I think some of the Cantab people have been on Stone Soup or something. I, I might have seen them, but I've, I've never gone. I'm not a big fan of slams myself. So I think the poetry readings uh, I've been to are pretty much in the mainstream in, in Massachusetts. Uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention is Paul Richmond's, uh, you know, uh, Fall, Fall River, Great Falls Poetry Festival in October. That's a nice event. Oh, very nice. Well, John, it was a pleasure having you and uh, giving you a full feature. And let me show the folks at home or the folks on the stream some of the your books. There is the Alchemics Grandson changes his name. That's uh, recent. Arugula, some short stories. And these are all very, very. I remember if a foreigner, wherever I go, I came out early in 2020. There's just, and here's some of the spy books. I think there's nearly something. I love the cover of Dances of Freedom. I think there's nearly something for uh, everybody, wouldn't you say? Oh, I'd say so. Absolutely. They're all for everybody. Just buy every single one of them. It's several copies. Give them to your friends. Give them to people you don't even know. <laughs> now, let me remind folks, too, that when you do live readings, it's easy to sell books. So John's here doing a, giving us time and effort for a feature. So if you like what you heard, research this stuff, find out where to buy it and buy it. Yes, yeah, so my, my website has a books tab and you know, it has links to all my books and you know, and that is John without an H, John Wessick, no double letters, johnwessick.com. So, uh, John, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And the folks watching the stream, unless uh, we've been banned and shut off, I'm going to shut the stream down right now. Um, and uh, if you want to come in for the open mic, just use the Zoom link that's on the uh, Facebook page.